Okay. Um, uh, it's truly an honor to introduce our last speaker. Um, not only is he in charge of the Walter Reed Army Medical Center and its 600 physicians, he's also commander of the Northern Region Medical Command, which is responsible for 16 medical treatment facilities uh, in 20 states, uh, which means about 13,000 healthcare providers. They provide care for over 400,000 patients, which means in a typical way they're writing 20,000 prescriptions and, 10, 000, and doing 10,000 clinic visits. She is responsible for making sure all this runs smoothly. She's also the commander of the United States Army Medical Corps, um, which means she's responsible for the, the careers and the development of 4,300 physicians uh, in the United States Army. She is board certified in OBGYN and as a member of ACOG. She has served as consultant for the Surgeon General on women's issues, uh, health issues, and in OBGYN care. She has commanded two other hospitals, William Beaumont and uh, Army Medical Center in El Paso and Tripler, where I am now in Hawaii. She has also been the commander of the European Regional Medical Command. Uh, her list of military awards is far too long to detail, but they include, <laughs> and she's going to cut me off and, and make me stop, but I would like to present to you uh, Major General Holly Bolin. That's good. Thank you very much, and it's, it's my honor to be here today. Um, going to talk a bit about uh, Army medicine. Uh, if we have a glitch in this presentation, I am known as Princess Dark Cloud around computers, so it's not the IMIT guy's fault, it's mine. Uh, no financial disclosures, but Army Strong uh, is our key to Army resilience, so it is more than a slogan. And our mission is uh, to promote uh, soldier health but also to equip that medical force and to keep it ready for any operation, not only uh, in the war zone, but also uh, when it comes back uh, to keep it ready to treat back home. And so one of our key things is to maintain that clinical competency across not only the deployment spectrum, but also back home, as I've said. So we're gonna cover some of the operational tempo, that deployment cycle, and then some of the associated problems uh, that we have with the training requirements as well as maintenance of that clinical competency. For definition of clinical competency, some of my roles as the medical core is graduate medical education and to keep that um, going because a third of my medical physicians of that 4,300, I have 1,500 in graduate medical ed education at any one time. And we follow all the C ACGME rules uh, like the civilian programs. And most of our programs are in the top uh, ones. We have 60% uh, of our programs get the five years, uh, four to five years uh, accreditation at any one time. So we do very well with that. And then we maintain, of course, our licensure and the board certification. We have found, uh, and as many in the civilian programs, that cognitive skills decay more rapidly than motor skills. When you're tired, you can still close the abdomen. That's a motor skill, but that cognitive skill of that diagnosis is what erodes more. And perceptual skills also decline rapidly with increasing age, if not regularly practiced. That's why I still go to the OR. They still let me in and they still let me escape once in a while. I love being there, because then I get a call and it's like, I'm sorry, I can't leave the operating room. They'll have to come back. That's where I escape. But combat casualty care is part of our training and our basic soldier skills uh, for our physicians when they go in the war zone. And then we also have the clinical care, the education, and then, of course, scholarly productivity. And academics is how I keep my physicians in the Army, as well as retraining them. If they want to train in a different specialty, I can also entice them to stay as well. And I've, I'm very proud of the fact that we have, have a 69% retention rate uh, in Army physicians. But our problems are a training requirement, both pre- and post-deployment, because it does have an organizational impact. Uh, it's costly, of course, to retrain physicians. Graduate medical education, because I do have to deploy physicians that are in academics, and so we have to keep, while we're training our residents, we also have to deploy their trainers uh, and then bring them back and get them trained back up again. And how do we maintain that clinical competency in a multidimensional military medicine environment? Of my 4,300 physicians in military medicine, I have 407 that have had two deployments uh, or more, 133 or more deployments. 
And while 113 days are average deployment length, some deploy for a year. And I have general surgeons that are now down to sometimes seven months between deployments. And we luckily have been this year able to rearrange some deployments, so I saved general surgeons this year from going back uh, after seven months and are able to get them more than a year at home. But we've had 2,800 deployments of those 4,300 physicians in support of these wars. And if you remember that 4,300 subtract that 1,500 that are in graduate me medical education and are not eligible for deployment. So pretty much everyone's deployed. The most frequently deployed are those in family medicine because primary care is very important in the battlefield. And then general surgeons and emergency physicians are right up there. And then orthopedic surgeons, internists, and then you can see as it cascades down. OBGYNs deploy. Uh, they deploy as general surgeons in some cases. They deploy as primary care. But I do have an OBGYN that called me. He's one of the physicians I train, so they call me mom. But he had a series of five placenta accretas that were hemorrhaging, and they were in the area of an IED, and so were thrown in with the um, evacuees back to a, a hospital because they thought they were wounded because they were hemorrhaging postpartum. They actually were placenta accretas. So then the trauma evaluation threw them back to him, and he had a series of five. Uh, that's a very unique caseload over in OEF. Our deployment cycle right now is one-to-one -one, uh, for a lot of physicians, one year over, one year back. And we're working towards one-to-two where you have one year deployed, two year back in the active component. And that is for all soldiers and we're working to get one-to-four in the Guard and Reserve. And pretty soon we'll achieve that in our uh, components. But unfortunately for physicians in some of our heavy, heavily needed phys physician types and our specialties, we're still working towards that actively. But on our Army Force Generation model, we're working towards reset, train, ready, and then available for deployment. And those are the cycles that we like to get back. And we're doing that with physicians as well. When they come back, we need to reset them, retrain them, and then they're ready to go again. So what are our training objectives for our physician soldiers? Combat casualty care, that is well defined. But then post-deployment, we have resumption of typical clinical and surgical duties, and that is poorly defined. And we're trying to get better at that when they come back, is to find what skills they have lost and need to be retrained in. Because even if you're a surgeon and you go over and perform surgical skills, you're not doing the whole breadth of your specialty that you do in peacetime healthcare. Orthopedics, you're not doing total joints over in theater. So we're minding that gap. So what are the gaps? In pre-deployment, training for other wartime missions. Primary care, all physicians do some aspect of that. And host nation care, how do we train for that? And how do we do a baseline assessment of psychomotor skills? Madigan is trying to assess that. So we have an objective assessment of psychomotor skills before and then test the same physician afterwards, especially like in laparoscopic skills. How fast are they before they go to theater? And then how fast are they after? So what have they lost and what do we need to retrain to get them back to their pre-deployment skills? In deployment, we're looking at how do we do refresher training for combat casualty care that they need because they may be in a place in theater where they're not practicing that on a regular basis. And then how do we maintain the skills that they have back home in peacetime healthcare while they're deployed? And then post-deployment, how do we do a rapid assessment of competency? And then how do we standardize the curricular for reintegration? And actually, our uh, civilian colleagues uh, are act actually looking to us to solve some of that because they're looking at how to reintegrate like for female physicians that have taken off for pregnancy and to raise a family and then how are we reintegrating that and this thing is jumping ahead on me so solutions for training opportunities one for pre-deployment we're building uh, enhanced training in primary care and host nation skills and doing that baseline assessment in deployment we're looking at how we can do enhanced training in theater and looking at IT solutions for how we do that forward and back capability and how we can use those IT solutions for what physicians need in theater. And then for post-deployment, how do we do those objective assessments and develop standardized curricula for integrating in clinical practice? 
and future solutions, again, cell phone, PC technologies that they can use in theater and advanced technologies to support that training. Simulation is becoming a big part of how we're doing training. And we're doing high and low fidelity models, how we can do mobile platforms and also use that in theater to keep folks trained, and how we keep cognitive capabilities so that we don't lose that cognitive uh, part of our training that we lose if we don't use that. And then look at critical diseases, host nation diseases, so that physicians and our other medics have that capability at their fingertips so that they can access that. At our power projection platforms and divisional posts, we are looking at simulation training centers across the whole spectrum from our medics, our nurses, our physicians, across the whole spectrum of what we deploy to train both in what we can prevent in theater for hemorrhage, airway obstruction, and tension pneumothorax, all the way up to the comprehensive trauma training and how we can increase the survivability of the battlefield. And that has worked very well. But we're also looking at post-deployment and how we get skills back. And these are all the centers that we have medical simulation training across the spectrum in the Army. So we have huge investments in medical simulation for our medics on up and that's why we have had such a high survivability on the battlefield. In fact, Baltimore Trauma says that if you are on a freeway a mile and a half south of them and you have a motorcycle accident and lose your legs, that you have a better survivability in Afghanistan than you do there because you get evacuated faster and you have a medic that throws on the tourniquet, starts your IV, et cetera, that you will actually survive better in Afghanistan. But redeployment training is also important, and we now have a published uh, policy that includes the simulation training at our central simulation committee sites that can set that up for you if you need refresher training in laparoscopic skills because we don't have laparoscopic training every place and laparoscopic surgery in every place in theater. So that, and that is one of the skills that is really lost when you go to theater. But we have that uh, uh, training that's offered, and we can set that up And when people come back if they need that training. We looked at redeployment skills and surveyed physicians. And for clinical skills, 40% of physicians said it took about six months or longer to get all their skills back. And for surgical skills, 30% said it took at least six months. And it depended exactly how much you used your own specialty when you were trained when you were deployed, and 50% of providers responded that they did not practice in their primary specialty. So it really depended on how much your primary specialty you actually used for how, much, how long it took for you to get trained back into your specialty. So when a provider returns to an MTF from deployment, uh, the MTF can notify the uh, committee and then they can send a survey, and we're trying to do that so that we get better fidelity on how long it takes folks to get their skills back. They also, if you go to the right side of this chart, the provider is to meet with the department chief or the deputy commander for clinical services, the chief doc at their MTF, and then determine what skills have been degraded, and then see if they need just supervision for their tr uh, training, to get back online or if they need simulation training and then the committee will set that up so that we can get folks back to speed faster and they can be more comfortable when they get back to peacetime healthcare. So now on to Army Medicine. And at least we made the front page of Time as person of the year and these are soldier medics and including females in that photo. Uh, photo. And we tell uh, folks, uh, our trainees and our residents that we can offer another intangible experience, which is deployment. And this is the MASH uh, set up in Misau, Germany. And we actually got to go to Pakistan because the word went out after the earthquake, who can get medical care there in 10 days? And I was in Europe at the time, and the MASH had just returned from Africa from a humanitarian mission, and their stuff was still loaded up on the pallets. So we did, we, they said, get us a plane, and we can get them there. So we loaded them back up put the folks on the plane, and I don't know what insects and other diseases that we took from Africa to Pakistan, but at least it was the middle of winter, so we figured they would be all killed off just by the cold. But we got them there in 10 days, and they set up and uh, did a tremendous job and uh, took care of the Pakistan for that humanitarian mission. 
But they also set up in convoy in Iraq. This was the last mass standing. It is now a cache, but we had a big celebration afterwards. And this is John Cho, who now is commanding Lawn Stool, but he's got the surgical team set up. But this is also the humanitarian missions of setting up healthcare in the communities, helping the physicians in their own communities set up their healthcare. But of course, when you have the wounded, you have the call that goes out to the medic. And they get loaded up and taken for definitive care for that first stop. And it may be a forward surgical team or a cache. And then they get loaded on the plane and then sent to lawn stool for their second stage for their fourth level of care. And then on to Walter Reed. I wanted to show you, uh, because you've heard what all of these great physicians next to me do over in theater, and I wanted to show you uh, today what the follow-on care is uh, at Walter Reed to show you what we can do with those horrendous injuries that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are suffering in theater. As of 16 February 2011, we've had almost 10,000 service members evacuated from OIF, OEF, and now OND since October 2001. We also deploy from Walter Reed, so these are the numbers that we have deployed ourselves in support of the war effort. And some might ask why we do it. This is um, a photo of a special ops um, soldier that lost his leg. He has a high AK. He went back to theater. He is still performing in special ops. We sent him with spare parts. The only way you know that they go back with spare parts is they have two extra legs strapped to the back of their knapsack. And to quote this soldier, he went back with spare parts so if the bastards blew it off again, he could plug and play. They wear t-shirts when they're in my MATC, which is my military advanced training center, that says on the front, missing parts in action, and on the back it says, some assembly required. But they still step forward while others seek safety to do the mission of our country. Battlefield survival, uh, we've increased that. That's one of the products of war, unfortunately, but we try to make it better so that folks can survive. The body armor that you see at the top has protected folks against central wounds. We still get them on occasion. But because we aren't getting as many central wounds, we have increased survival because it's gone to extremity wounds. We've got advanced evacuation capabilities. Medics, instead of just being able to put on a pressure dressing, can now do hemostatic dressings. We've got one-handed tourniquets. We've got IVs, and they are uh, certified in advanced medical techniques. We've got advances in antibiotic therapy as well. The survivability has gone up to 90.8, and now it's up to about 95%. If you make it to the cash, you've got a 95% chance of making it. OEF is getting better because we're getting hospitals farther forward so that the evacuation distances are getting shorter. So it is getting better in Afghanistan as well. Science and technology are getting better. We're doing increased research. Uh, we're now researching uh, as well uh, in our dermatology section on how to get skin better. Where is the only place you can form calluses on your skin? It's the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. You think as many times as everybody falls down when they're on roller skates when their kid's growing up that you skin your knees, that you think you'd form a callus there, but you do not. You keep skinning your knees and your mom puts Band-Aids on them. And that's the problem. We have stumps. Everybody keeps getting blisters. We're trying to do research to teach skin to form calluses. If we could do that on the ends of stumps, then nobody would ever get a blister on their stumps and have to go back in a wheelchair till it heals. So a comprehensive program takes all of this teamwork to have these soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines survive their injuries and get back to normal and get back to ability instead of disability. It takes a whole village. And these are all of our partners as well in civilian academia as well as government to help get the tools that they need to get back to ability. 
But we also have commitment of all of our folks uh, as we get back. We're joining Walter Reed in Bethesda to become the new Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And that is on target and we will be moved in in August. Uh, so come see us as well as a brand new hospital at Belvoir. But teaching wounded warriors to walk again, priceless. This is our military advanced training center. We have replicated that at Bethesda when we move into the, our new digs for the new Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And this is where our amputees train so that they can use their prosthetics and get back up. We also have a shooting range where they learn to shoot their weapons again. This gets them back into feeling to be a soldier and a Marine again. But we also teach them on their old hunting weapons. So they can bring their weapons in. We'll adjust their prosthetics so they can hold their weapon and go hunting. Uh, we also are having the uh, Paralympics coming up, our warrior games that will be in Colorado Springs in um, May. And they have a shooting uh, competition as well, uh, as well as archery. So we teach them, and we will make their prosthetics adapt to this. Most of our amputees have a whole drawer full of, uh, of adjusted prosthetics. We had one that was a wood carver. We put a black and decker in his arm and gave him all the attachments. He said he's better now than when he had a hand. Um, for the Karen, this is a balance disc that's in the middle. You can actually put a pencil on it and the computer will keep that pencil standing up on its point and will not let it fall. We put the guys in their prosthetics on this. They will not fall on this. And they have, this guy is skiing. You can see in the front part. He is skiing on that range. He has to guide and ski. It will not let him fall down. We have him standing in a boat. Uh, they have to go through the gates, et cetera. But this teaches them balance again. It also, for our head injuries, will teach them balance as well. We also have a gate lab, which it has a pressure plate that they walk on. It has 31 cameras. We put dots on them that the camera picks up. There's 31 cameras around the top. It also has a pressure plate that they walk on. We make sure that they're putting equal pressure on their prosthetics as well as adjust their prosthetics so that they're balanced and they walk perfectly straight. Um, that way that when they're walking downtown, you can't tell they're, pro they're wearing prosthetics if they wear pants. However, my double prosthetics at Washington, D.C. wear shorts all year round. They look at me and they go, my legs don't get cold. Like, what's your problem? But we're doing the next generation prosthetics. Uh, we've got microprocessors in the knees that pick up the gait that will actually pick up the leg and throw it forward at the proper distance. Uh, Industry told us you had to have a normal leg for the computer to read off of. My, um, my double amputees shit said bullshit to that. They put the microprocessor knees on both legs and got it to work. So they, um, my, pro my amputees are actually willing to do research on prosthetics and develop them even better for the next guys that come along. But it makes it much easier on these power knees to go up and down stairs. Because you will use 40 to 60% more energy with a prosthetic just getting up and down than you and I do walking. And so they'll do anything to make it easier for the next guy coming along to go up and down stairs. And they originally were very noisy. We've gotten them down to where they're quiet. And so because um, they'll use, they want to use the stairs instead of the ramp because they want ability, not disability. Our return to duty rate, everybody thinks that everybody is disabled and goes, you know, re is retired, is released from active duty, et cetera. I just want to say that we have 71% of folks go back to duty from the wounded warriors that we have at Walter Reed. The average rank is E4 to E8. That is a trained Army or um, soldier or Marine. His replacement or her replacement would be fresh out of basic training. And so we're returning trained soldiers and Marines back to the force, which is very important for regenerating that force. So uh, we're doing a great job as far as getting these people back to duty. But we are taking care of a unique patient population. And they are soldier and Marine athletes. And we have to remember this. These guys are finishing a marathon.
and they're urging each other along. And they have various parts missing, uh, as you know. And they have uh, a usual, uh, you know, a unique and unusual pre-morbid activity level. But I think they really need to put the smoke on the guy with the artificial limbs. Then they don't have to worry, we don't have to worry about burning this guy's ankle if it gets out, you know, out of line. So, but this is a, a black knight that was a double amputee and he's still jumping. We also have a 3D application center uh, and this is to replace parts, uh, especially when we have a head injury and we have to remove part of the skull. And we actually found that by removing part of the skull instead of doing burr holes, that it actually cools the brain to room temperature. Where before we had to do massive cooling to try to cool down the brain to prevent swelling. With burr holes, you could only get it maybe to 90 degrees and that was with cooling the whole body. You take a big flap out of the skull, you actually cool it to room temperature and it works much better. But then the bone flaps oftentimes were destroyed because they were in multiple pieces. And we, so we have a 3D application center where we actually reconstruct what we need to replace. So here we have, obviously, a defect that then we have to make the bone to replace this. This is our Sergeant Major of Walter Reed, and they made a little mini-me of him. But our reconstruction these are the service components that use this 3D imaging, and uh, CNT, oral maxillofacial, uh, and all the others. And this, these are the injuries that we have fixed using this. And this is one of our guys that lost his whole frontal lobe. This is before, this is after. We take their picture, we take the CT scan, we throw it in the computer, and they construct the part. This was his skull. This is a reconstructed part, and now we use titanium mesh because then the tissue can grow into it, and then when, if it gets infected, we don't have to take out the part and do it again. This is before, this is after. Once he grows some hair, throws on a pair of sunglasses, nobody's going to know he was ever missing parts. And of course, then we have our robotic surgery as well. But technology, we still have to train our soldiers and Marines on how to get around. So we have obstacle courses that we train them on so they can get around in the civilian community. And technology doesn't replace determination either. This is Tammy Duckworth, who now is an assistant secretary in the VA. And this is a guy that used to rap dance. He landed the first jump. That was six weeks after he got his prosthetic. First time with a jump rope. We also have cosmetic prosthesis where we will match their hands, we'll put on the hair, we paint them from the inside of the plastic prosthesis so that the paint does not wear off. We had the uh, New Orleans Saints come through, uh, one guy signed his arm, the next day I, he didn't have, wasn't wearing his arm, I said, where's your arm? He said, it's in the prosthetic slab, I'm having them relaminated so I don't lose Drew Brees' signature. We had a gal that lost her arm. She had a prosthetic arm on. She was on Oprah. Oprah couldn't tell which one was the prosthetic till she shook her hand. That's how good we are. And I have a tattoo artist who replaces the tattoos that the guys lost because then it makes it their arm. We also have targeted muscle reinnervation. When we have to re remove an upper extremity, we save the median and ulnar nerves and we reimplant them on the pectoralis muscle so the nerves stay alive. Then when we put their arm on, we attach, just like EKG leads, we attach it to the pectoralis muscle. We touch them and we go, what's this? That's my little finger. Hook the thing on. Hook the lead on. What's this? That's my thumb. What's this? Second finger, third finger, fourth finger. We hook it up. It takes 20 seconds to hook it up. It takes them 20 minutes to figure out the prosthesis. And then they can drink a glass of water correctly instead of the old hook where they could shrug and only had seven ranges of motion and they'd throw it over their shoulder the first time. And it took them months to figure it out. This, it takes them 20 minutes, 22 ranges of motion, and 
this is what we've hooked up. And then we have the plastic sleeves that go on top of it that you saw that were painted, hair that matches the other one, etc. So that, and, and all of it's gotten smaller now. But this is what now works so that now they have the normal hand motion. The next thing we're working on is sensory pads so that then we can have the blind folks use a prosthetic. Because right now you have to see a prosthetic to know where it is. If we get sensory, then the blind folks will be able to use it as well. But it's also inspiration, and you have to have sometimes your kids to do the, get inspiration to use two hours each day in physical therapy. But he's holding his daughter with his artificial hand. The only way you know is the fold's a little extra prominent there. Let's see, do I have to hit this again? There we go. Okay. Come on, run. Yeah, we're ready. Go. When he gets down here, I want you to, can you tell he's got a prosthetic? He's got perfect balance. Here's a double amputee rollerblading. Crossover turns, pretty good. He's on a halter, so he can't fall. It goes around 360 degrees in my matsy. This is the obstacle course at West Point. We took seven of our amputees up there. The cadets have to pass this. They have four months to practice. My amputees had four hours. They all passed. The cadets learned something. And of course, we have our loyalty of our folks that work there. Our return to duty amputees, in the old days it was 2.3%. I have 20% of return to duty. 39, we're now up to 47% have returned to theater, have redeployed, again, as I said, um, with spare parts. We also do sports. Uh, as you saw there, skiing, probably the first sport that was adapted. We now have prosthetics that will go in seawater so they can scuba dive, um, water skiing. This is the old uh, West Point captain of the lacrosse team. He went back and played on the alumni team. But this is what we want to get back to. Normal, back to families, back to function. And this is what we do, all of us in the service, is binding the wounds of war. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill in 1898 when he was a lieutenant in the Malacan Field Force. The profession of medicine and surgery must always rank as the most noble that men can adopt. The spectacle of a doctor in action among soldiers in equal danger and with equal courage, saving life where all others are taking it, is one which must always seem glorious, whether to God or man. So I must thank all of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines that serve their country and the physicians that take care of them from all of the services. We're all in this together, and we all get them back to the ability that they can do, not the disability. So thank you all very much.